Welcome back. So um, my, uh, my agenda for today, I want to do maybe 20 to 30 minutes of new stuff, which will not be on the test on Friday. And then I got a, uh, a review sheet, and we can talk about whatever you like for the test on Friday. Does that sound all right? All right. We do, uh, we do have homework due, as usual, tomorrow. Check it out. So what I want to talk about... This uh, will not be on the test on Friday. I suppose this will be a leftover thing which will appear on the uh, third test. Um, I would like to talk about finding Euler paths and circuits. This is something that we haven't really talked about in detail yet. Finding them. Uh, we have talked in detail about how do you know if there's an Euler circuit? Or how do you know if there's an Euler path? These are easy questions to answer. And I hope you remember, there's an Euler circuit when all the degrees are even. And there's an Euler path when there's two odds and the rest are even, all right? So that's how you know if there's an Euler circuit or an Euler path. But actually finding them uh, is a different matter entirely. If I give you a graph and say, draw me the Euler circuit, that's, uh, that's harder than just if I ask you, is there an Euler circuit or not? You can very easily say yes or no, there is or there is not. But to actually find the Euler circuit is more difficult, and that's what I want to talk about today. So actually today we're going to talk about an algorithm for building uh, Euler circuits and paths. Paths. All right, an algorithm. That is, uh, this is a fancy word, algorithm, which means just some kind of specific procedure for doing or for solving a problem, which will always lead to the correct answer after a certain amount of steps. So this is just like a, some kind of formal procedure. Algorithm these days, that word is typically used to mean a computer program. We're not going to try to make a computer do this, but uh, computers, when they operate, they operate according to algorithms. That is, specific procedures that some programmer wrote a program for. But uh, anyway, uh, I want to talk about a specific procedure for creating Euler circuits and Euler paths. Anybody happen to know, a little trivia question, anyone happen to know where the word algorithm comes from? This is an interesting little uh, tidbit of knowledge you can share with your friends. This, uh, this word, algorithm, comes from a, a person's name. This is named after a guy who is, today we know him as um, al Khwarizmi, one of the uh, all-time greats, if you want to go with like mathematicians of, uh, throughout history. Uh, he was um, in, the, uh, in the Baghdad School of Mathematics. This was back when, um, when the Middle East was really the, uh, the big game in town. And the, uh, this is like uh, in, I think al Khwarizmi lived around like the year 800, something like that, um, long before the Europeans um, were doing uh, worthwhile mathematics, or I suppose after the Greeks, but before, say, the, the you know, 1700s is when like the 1617, when Isaac Newton, those, those kind of people. Anyway, al Khwarizmi. Um, the, this guy's name is where the word algorithm comes from because it kind of sounds similar. Uh, al Khwarizmi was, um, among his great achievements, this, this is something that might, might blow your mind. I don't know if, you, um, if you're ready at this hour of the morning to have your mind blown, but one of the things that Al Khwarizmi is, is best known for, um, you know how like when you add up numbers, if you're doing like 27 plus 35, and you go seven plus five is two, and then you carry the one, and then you go 62, right? Al Khwarizmi invented that. Can you believe it? Uh, actually, so it, it's not quite clear uh, who precisely invented it, but Al Khwarizmi was the first person to write this down in a in a book or in a in a manuscript. Um, and uh, this is the way that I don't know about you. Most people don't even never even think about somebody inventing this. It's, we talk to a typical person somehow believes that like human beings were created by God with this knowledge already. But no, somebody had to invent that at some point in history. And um, 
Oh. They want me to update. Not today. Um, anyway, yeah, Al Khwarizmi. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing um, set of achievements. Also, he also came up with the word for, uh, for algebra. A lot of like math words that begin with al, they all come from Arabic, where al means something like the. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert in Arabic, but um, yeah, uh, algebra is also a version of a word that Al Khwarizmi invented. He invented um, the thing where you like add the same thing to both sides of an equation. That's that's Al Khwarizmi. That's what he described in his book uh, where he used this word, which we now say algebra. Anyway, that's all just uh, historical business. Al Khwarizmi had nothing to do with this algorithm for finding Euler circuits and paths. But anyway, let's talk about so. If I give you a complicated graph, can you draw me an Euler circuit or an Euler path? Um, the basic idea behind this, the basic concept is avoid bridges. Avoid bridges among the unused edges. All right. This is something that's a little difficult to keep track of as you're doing it in the back of your mind, but um, this is the basic strategy. Avoid bridges among the unused edges. I've got to explain what I mean by that. So in a graph, we haven't talked about this before, but there is such a thing as a bridge in a graph. Here's a graph. This graph has some bridges in it. How about that? All right, a bridge is an edge where if you took that edge out, it would make the graph disconnected. So that's what a bridge is. A bridge is an edge whose removal makes it disconnected. I hope everyone remembers what connected means and disconnected. So connected means it's like all one piece, whereas disconnected means it has kind of two separate chunks to it. So this graph right here is connected because it's all in one piece. You can get from any vertex to any other vertex along the path. Uh, does anybody see a bridge edge in this graph? Actually, I can see more than one. That would be an edge where if you removed it, it would disconnect the graph. I think I see this right here is a bridge. That's a bridge. Because if you take that edge out, then the whole thing becomes disconnected. Whereas something like this one here, this is not a bridge. Because if I take that one out, it's still connected, right? The graph is still all in one, uh, one piece. Um, how many other bridge edges do you see here? There's more. I see, yeah? Yeah, I see two more, and they're sort of right next to each other. These, these two here are both bridges. And everything else is not a bridge, all right? That's what a bridge in a graph is. It's fairly easy. Just look, look at a graph at a glance. You can identify where the bridges are, typically, OK? And uh, the idea, uh, so that's one example. Here's, here's another example. Uh, here's a graph that you see on the homework. There's nothing terribly interesting about this graph, but um, this graph has no bridges, right? You, there are no, uh, no edges here where when you take it out, it becomes disconnected. So no bridges here. There aren't, also, there aren't always bridges in a graph. All right? No bridges in that one. Um, so let me, uh, I will just restate again. The basic idea behind the procedure that you use to find an Euler circuit or an Euler graph. So here's the uh, procedure. This is actually, there's a name for this. It's named after a person. This is called Fleury's algorithm. And I actually know nothing about Fleury. I, have, I like to have little historical tidbits. I don't know if anybody cares. But uh, I know nothing about Fleury. Fleury's algorithm. This is the procedure for actually finding an Euler circuit or an Euler path in a graph. So the idea is, uh, basically, you can do whatever you want. Choose any edges. But there's kind of two, um, 
two uh, things you have to avoid. So first thing to avoid, don't finish early. Remember, an Euler circuit is meant to cover every edge once without repeating any edges. You don't want to actually like end up at the end before you've covered everything. So don't finish early. And don't finish early is an easy thing to keep in mind. This, this is the important part, what I'm about to say here. Don't finish early and never use an edge. which is a bridge among the unused edges. If you can follow these two rules, you will always get an Euler circuit or an Euler path. So you can choose any edges you like, but don't finish early and also never use an edge, which is a bridge among the unused edges. That's a little confusing. I just want to do a few examples. And then I got a big example for you to try, and that'll do it for, for today. All right, here's my example. You will have to copy down my graph. <coughs> All right, this is my graph. Can we find a Euler circuit in this graph? All right, so first of all, you should ask yourself, like, is it even possible? Is there an Euler circuit or not? This is a much easier question than actually finding it, but the question is, does it exist or not? It's just about, are all the degrees even? And uh, they are. This is a two, that's a four, that's a two, a two, a four, and a two. So all evens. So an Euler circuit does exist. All right, but that actually doesn't tell us how to find it. How do you find it? You do this, uh, you do Fleury's algorithm. That's the procedure to find it, all right? Um, let's find an Euler circuit. Now, when you're finding an Euler circuit, remember we, we said this last time, when you're finding an Euler circuit, you can start wherever you like. When you're finding an Euler path, you have to start at one of the odds and finish at the other odd. But for a circuit, you can start wherever you like. So I'm gonna say, just for fun, let's start at this one here. Let's start and end here, all right? That's not a requirement. Actually, you could do it starting in anywhere if you like, but I'm, I'm just choosing that one, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. This upper left corner is not two, it's four. Thanks. Definitely not two. Thank you for that. All right, we're gonna start and end at the bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna try to you know, if I was doing this myself, I would just like start drawing on top of here, but for the sake of me clearing, clearly communicating here, I'm gonna try to do this sort of in stages. So I begin with the original graph. Let me just draw it again here. This is the original graph and I'm starting here, all right? Now, when I begin there, um, where should I go from here? Well, I can either go straight up or up the diagonal, right? And actually, at this point, it doesn't matter because in this graph here, there is no bridge. So I'm just gonna try to do a little narration here. No bridge, so we can go wherever we like. Either up or diagonally to the left, right? Those are my two choices if I start here. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no reason to do one versus the other. You can do either way. Although I decided to go up the diagonal like this, all right? Just for, for funsies, I go up the diagonal to the left. Okay, and now I am going to look um, after the fact. I'm going to look after I made that choice. So the remaining edges, this is what's a little tricky here. You have to keep in mind at all times the edges that remain, which now is that graph, all right? These are the remaining edges. And I'm, I'm, right, uh, I'm right here, right? And I ask myself again, is there any bridge that I need to avoid? The algorithm says never take a bridge among the remaining edges, all right? And in here, again, I would say there is no bridge in that graph. And so 
I can still at this point choose any edge that I want to. So still no bridge. Choose whatever. Now I, um, when I was doing this on my paper, I decided to go across to the right. So I'm gonna go up here and then across to the right like that. All right. And each time you make a new choice, you have to think about what are the edges which remain and make sure that you choose appropriately. So after that, my remaining edges at this point, now I'm gonna keep on redrawing the graph, although when you're doing this, once you know what you're doing, you can basically do everything in your head, although just for the sake of being clear here, I'm gonna draw out remaining edges, at this point, I just use the one across the middle. So now it looks like this, right? And I am here. All right? Again, I ask myself, are there any bridges to avoid? And again, I say there are no bridges at this point. Although I know I should not go down. That would be finishing early, right? If you go down at this point, you'll get stuck um, at the uh, vertex down there. So. No bridges still. That means you can either go straight up or up the diagonal. Don't go down because that would be finishing early. Still no bridges. Let's say I decided to go up the diagonal here. So I'm gonna go up this way, all right? So I'm trying to keep track on my original picture here. My next choice was up that diagonal. And again, we have to now think about what are the bridges or the edges which remain? So now remaining are like this, right? And I'm now right here. And again, I ask, you know, what are we going to do next? And the answer is you must avoid any bridges in this picture. Now, at this point, actually, there are bridges right here. This is a bridge. This, and that's a bridge, and that's a bridge. Well, maybe not that last one. Those two, right, that I marked in blue, those are bridges, and we cannot use those. So don't use the bridges. All right. That means my choices are from here, from where the red dot is. I cannot go to the right across that edge. I can either go down one or down this uh, this long side path. How about I'll go down, uh, I'll go straight down one. Straight down like that, all right? So, sorry for my scrolling. I'm now gonna come down here, all right? And still, I am thinking about the edges which I did not use yet. So what remains now? Looks like uh, I have those, and then that, and then that, right? Those are the edges which remain now. And my guy is right here. And now, actually, I don't think we need to do uh, individual steps anymore. It's, it's clear now what you have to do. There's only one, uh, one way to go about finishing the rest of the picture, right? I go down, and then back up this guy, and across here, and down there. All right? so. I will say we just finish like that. Now we finish. All right, like so. Yes? So, yeah, technically what's happening here is at this point in this picture, there are many, many bridges like here and here and also here. So really what you do is I take this one first and then after I do this one, this one is no longer a bridge anymore. And so next I take this one. Do you believe me? You don't look, you don't look like you believe me. So I, if I draw the picture again after, after that first choice, my guy is here, right? And now the only bridge is right there. Because this edge will not disconnect the graph if I take it away. So as you, as you choose these edges one by one, the, the next one sort of stops being a bridge. Yeah, It's a little weird because from step to step, things which used to not be a bridge can become a bridge, and things which were a bridge can become not a bridge. All right, anyway, my final answer then, just to, to draw in the rest of it, 
I was just talking about, I was here, and then I go down, back up the side, across the top, and down this side. And then I made it. All right. This is how we find an Euler circuit without just like making it up. Now that example is small enough. I think you could just kind of make up this, um, this Euler circuit for yourself. All right. <coughs> Any thoughts about this? This, I, in my opinion, this is a little confusing um, until you, you just have to try to do a bunch of examples. Now, I wrote out all of these steps in an effort to be clear, although usually I would do all of these steps in my head as I'm going. So this is just uh, to make sure that everybody is understanding the thought process behind what we're doing. Let's just try a few more examples, and then I got one for you to try. So how about this is a fairly big graph. I don't know. It's not so big. How about that? Draw an Euler circuit in this graph. All right. You can start wherever you like. If it's going to be an Euler circuit, you can start wherever you want. So maybe I'll start in the upper left. Doesn't matter. All right. Now this one I'm not going to keep on redrawing. I'm going to try and just do it all at once. Although you have to keep in mind what you're doing um, in, your, in the back of your mind as you go. So from here, I have two choices. I can either go to the right or down. And really it doesn't matter because neither of those is a bridge. So let's just start off going to the right, I guess. All right. And I end up at this vertex. And now I have to think, what I'm thinking in, my, in, in the back of my mind is, are there any bridges only considering the edges that I didn't cover yet? Are there any bridges? And I think the answer is no, there are not any bridges. If I only look at the uh, edges which I didn't hit yet, I see no bridges. And so that means uh, I am still able to choose whichever direction I like from this point. Anybody have a, have a favorite direction? No, nobody cares. How about we go straight down? It really doesn't matter. It's going to work just fine as long as you don't cross a bridge among the unused edges. All right, so go straight down. I end up back in the middle. Now, are there any bridges among the edges that I haven't used yet? Uh, what you should be thinking of is the edges I haven't used, maybe I'll redraw just this once, is this, right? Those are the edges that I haven't used yet, and I believe there's no bridge among those edges. And so that means I still can do whatever I want in terms of making this choice. How about let's go straight down from here. All right. Straight down from here. So now the picture that I'm looking at in terms of all the edges which I didn't use is the same one I did here, although without that one, right? Because I just used that edge. If you have an erasable thing, it's not so hard to draw one picture of the ones you're using and draw another picture of the ones you have not yet used. Uh, anyway, I'm down here. Is there any edge in, uh, is there any bridge in this graph? I think not. So let's, uh, let's go around uh, to the right here. All right. I still see no bridges in the graph that remains of the edges that I haven't used yet. That would be this, this graph here, all right? Uh, I suppose I have to go up from there. <clears throat> and uh, still, there are no bridges among the unused edges. Can you see them in your mind? Just the black ones with no line on them. Um, there's no bridge among those edges. Maybe I will go, how about across the middle? And maybe across the middle again. All right. At this point, can I draw what, what we're looking at? The edges which remain are like this. I'm still feeling good about this. There are no bridges here. And actually, I, I feel like I can see where it's going to have to go. If I'm right there, I can either go down here and around and back up, or I could go around the other way. Let's, let's do like I did there. So the next, I'm going to go down around the bend here, up this diagonal, across this, down this one, and back to where I started. Like that. That's 
an Euler circuit. All right. When you just draw the answer, it's hard to say where did that come from, although there was a lot of thought that went into making that line go where it goes. It comes from avoiding uh, crossing bridges. Actually, never really came up in that, in that example, right? I did it in such a way that there weren't any bridges as I went. OK? Just one more thing. How about finding an Euler path? Everything that I've said so far is about Euler circuits. Can we do one where it's an Euler path? So how about, I'll start down here. Find an Euler path. There's actually nothing special about that. You just do exactly the same procedure. I'm just going to say that it's the same, but you must start at an odd degree vertex. Remember, our Euler path exists when there are two odds and the rest are evens. And the way you, um, the way you, it works out, the uh, odds are always the starting and the ending point, and the evens are all the other ones. So you must start at an odd degree and end at the other odd. Right? You have to start at one of the odds, and there's going to be two odds. You start at one of them, and you will end at the other. Actually, you don't have to try to end at the other one. If you're doing it properly, you will just sort of magically end up at the other odd vertex. This sounds like maybe it's going to be harder. It's really not. So how about, here's an example. How about this? It's similar to the one I just did, but with one, one fewer diagonal. All right, find an Euler path. All right, so first of all, we have to start at an odd. So you got to actually look at the vertices and find where the odd ones are. Because one of them is going to be where you start and the other is going to be where you finish. Um, if I look at the degrees here, that's a two, that's a four, that's a two, a four, a four, that's a three, a two, a three, and a two. So these ones, the threes, are the odds. I'm going to start at one of them and if you do it properly, you will just magically end at the other one automatically. You don't have to kind of aim for it. You will automatically end up at the other one. All right, uh, so maybe I'll start at the one on the bottom. It doesn't matter which one you start at. I'll start at the one on the bottom. And do the same procedure. You go across uh, edges. You can choose whatever edge you like as you go, but you never cross a bridge until you're actually uh, done and you don't uh, don't finish early is the other rule I said. How about I go left, which means I have to immediately go up like that. All right. And then maybe I'll do the triangle in the, uh, in the top corner here. One way to make sure there's no bridges is if you can, this is a decent strategy, keep all the edges that I didn't do kind of on one side I'm trying to go across this side first and maybe make my way back this way. This is a, a vague strategy that I have in mind. That's because um, the only way you cross a bridge is if you split them into like two separate parts. But if I keep all of the unused edges all together in one chunk, that will avoid crossing any bridges. Anyway, do like that. And then I have to come across the middle here. All right. Now what remains is all together, right? What remains at this point is just like that. And so uh, maybe I'll go up top first. Then I have to go across here. I have to come down here. And now what remains is just a square. And you can just go around the edge of the square. And you will end up back at this three. So maybe I'll come around this way. There you go. I made it. All right, this is finding an Euler path. You got to start at the odd, and you'll end at the other odd. But otherwise, it's the same, the same idea, the same procedure. All right, anybody got questions about that one? I got a big one for you all to try then, and then that'll do it for us. You should probably draw this kind of big, because it's kind of big. Um, how about 
here is an example. This is most interesting when it's big. All right. Sorry, I went off the bottom there. There's no, no, nothing very interesting at the bottom. It's just one of these. All right. Your job is to draw either an Euler circuit or an Euler path. So you'll have to decide, first of all, which, which one you're going for. Is it going to be an Euler circuit or an Euler path? And then see if you can draw it in. I'll give you a few moments. And then we'll talk about the test.
Is that okay if I want to like go around and do a Oh, you went around here and then back around? Uh, can we go over this one? I don't know if everybody's uh, finished or not. I saw at least um, uh, people decided it's got to be a path in this case. You can't do an Euler circuit in this one. If you look at the degrees, which is where you should begin, um, they are all evens except for these two threes. All right, the other degrees don't really matter, but uh, they're all evens if you check them all. I suppose you have to check them all just to know that they're all evens, but they are all even. So the fact that I have two, those two threes means that's where I'm gonna have to start my path at one of them and then finish at the other one. So let's, uh, and there are many, many ways you could do this. I'm gonna try and make it happen here. I'll start at this one here. Uh, as of now, there are no bridges in the graph, so you can start off, just kind of do whatever. Um, maybe I will come around here. How about like that? And then down like this. I'll have to do something like this. All right, I just made a, a bunch of choices, although um, have I separated the rest of the graph into two pieces? I think I have not. I, don't, I have not crossed any bridges because all the edges which remain are still one, one big connected piece, right? All the edges which remain are these ones out here plus that one there and this one here. That's still one big connected piece. Now, uh, I believe this is now a bridge among the edges which I haven't used yet. Uh, so my next choice will not be to come back in here because that's a bridge now, but I can choose whatever else. So maybe I will, uh, how about I'll go around this sort of inner square here. All right. Still in the back of my mind, I am keeping in mind the edges which I didn't use yet. The edges which I didn't use yet are this outer sort of diamond plus those two. And those are all still all connected together in one piece. In fact, I think I can see how to finish it off. Maybe I'll go around the outside diamond and then back through here and I'll be back to where I started. So uh, this guy, I'm gonna go back and around this way, all the way around the outside. And then come back where I started like this. Finally end up right there. All right, that's how I did it. I'm sure you all did not make the same choices that I did, uh, but this is one valid way to do it. Anybody got any questions? I hope that, uh, that this made sense to you. Really, no matter how big the graph is, it should always be possible to do this procedure. Yes? Uh, I wasn't going to. You want to? There's gonna be there's gonna be ones on your next homework assignment, I guess. This will not appear on the test this week because uh, because it's it's not. All right. Okay, I think that'll do it then for the new, this is the new stuff I wanted to do today. I said 30 minutes. It was more like 40 minutes. I hope you don't mind. Um, I got the review sheet here then. So uh, I would be happy to discuss anything that you want to talk about that you see on the paper or otherwise. If you have questions about the homework that's due tomorrow, we can talk about that too. Because all of that, everything on the homework due tomorrow will be you know, fair game for the test. I'm going to put this uh, on the website also. Get it that way if you want. And there are answers on the back. All right.
right, so one thing that I noticed as soon as I printed this out, the, the Batmans on the bottom there, it's very hard to see. I'm sorry about that. You've got to look very carefully to tell the difference between the dots and the stars. But uh, on the test, I will make it bigger than that. Um, I hope you don't have too much of a uh, problem. So anyway, the topics, as far as I can tell, the first thing is the Bonsoff. I hope you remember how to do the Bonsoff. We can try an example like that if you like. Um, and then we had the gerrymandering. So the first, uh, the first thing about gerrymandering is I can show you a map and tell you to divide it up in various different ways. You should be able to say what are the possible outcomes versus the impossible outcomes. This has to do with the deciding for yourself what the threshold to win is. I hope you remember something like that. Um, then, uh, so number four and five are about the efficiency gap. I hope you remember how to do that. You make sort of a chart and then your answer is a fraction. You're not going to have a calculator on the test, so as always, you leave your answer as a fraction. You don't have to simplify. Um, then we talked about the convex hull and the convex hull ratio of a shape. Again, that's a fraction, which I will not expect you to simplify. And then the isoperimetric quotient. This is the only formula that I will expect you to know, I suppose, for the whole semester, is the isoperimetric quotient formula, which I hope you all remember. It's uh, 4 pi times the area divided by the perimeter squared. Um, when it comes to the test, you just have to basically plug into that formula and do nothing else, because you're not going to be able to simplify anything without a calculator. All right. Then the graph theory stuff, which is um, really what's, uh, what's on the homework for this week is the graph theory stuff, uh, plus last week. You should know Euler circuits and Euler paths. Does it exist or not? Um, I'm not going to ask you to do something like this, find an Euler circuit in a big graph, although in a small one I might ask you to, one that you can more or less just look at and figure out without any sophisticated methods. You should know about what makes a graph connected or disconnected what the degree of a, uh, of a vertex means. You should know the sum of degrees theorem, which says that uh, the sum of the degrees is always even. All right. Anybody got any questions about that? Or just like vague questions about the, the test in general? Uh, yeah? You said that we might be asked to draw a circuit or path, but for a smaller graph? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Something, something like this, I think, is hard to just kind of make it up and get it right. But uh, on a very small graph, it's not so hard to just make something up and it'll work out. Not that. This is too big. Maybe a smaller one. Like, for instance, uh, can you tell me in this graph, either draw an Euler circuit or an Euler path or say that none of them exists. You look at the degrees, here they are 2, 3, 3, 2. So there's two odds, which means there is an Euler path. Can I draw it? Yeah, it's like that, right? It's an ugly drawing of the Euler path. All right, so some, something at that level, I would expect you to be able to draw it. You just kind of make it up. Um, although a very, a very big one, I'm not going to ask you to do. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to start on one of the odds, and you will end at the other odd. Okay. Unless you're making a circuit, like they're all even, you can make a circuit, and, and in that case, you start wherever you like. Um, would anyone like to try, you know, just an example of this or that? Uh, do you want to talk about the Bonsoff? I know we haven't done that in a while. Yeah? Let's try a, an example of the Bonsoff. You can see one on the paper there. I'll just, I'll invent another one here. Let's try the bonds off. How about, um, I don't know. I'm just making this up. 18, uh, how about 11, 10, 9. That's not very interesting. That's all right. It doesn't matter. All right, let's find the bonds off for this. 18, 11, 10, 9. Um, I'm going to name these guys ABC. I'm always going to call them ABC. And the Bonsoff involves, first of all, I mean, you make a big chart. You just have to remember how to do the chart. 
the first column in the chart is all the different combinations of the voters. They are A, B, C. So I could take all three of them together, A, B, C, or I could take various combinations of only two of them. It could be A, B, or A, C, or B, C, all right? Remember, in these combinations, the ordering doesn't matter. You just write down all the different possible ways you could choose them. You could choose all three together. You could choose any two together in three different ways. I could choose any one by itself. That would be just A, just B, just C, or I could choose nobody, which I always write like that. The nobody one never ends up mattering, but for the sake of completeness, it should be in there. All right. Anybody remember how to do these? What, what, did, what did I do next in the Bonshoff chart? Yeah? Yes, in, in the next uh, column, I would write the total weight from each combination. So in ABC, what's the total weight of that? I just add up the numbers, 12, uh, 11 and 10 and 9. That would be 30, right? I think that's 30. OK, in AB, it's 11 plus 10, 21. AC is 11 plus 9, is 20. BC is 10 plus 9, is 19. A by itself is 11, B by itself is 10, C by itself is 9, and nobody is 0. All right, those are the total weights of each one. And now, this is the important step, I am going to decide who is critical in each combination. Critical? Who is critical in each combination? So in ABC, which adds up to 30, this is, the, this is the hard part, such as it is. It's not really hard if you know what you're doing, but this adds up to 30. I ask myself, is A critical? Remember, what this means is, um, if I remove A, does this no longer meet the quota? <laughs> actually, sorry, I meant to say before, I only have to consider the ones that actually make it to 18, right? So these guys don't matter down here because they add up to 11 or less. Anyway. Um, in, uh, in the first row, it adds up to 30. I ask myself, for example, with A, do I really need the A in there to make it to uh, 18? The answer is no, because A is worth 11. It adds up to 30 as is. If I take the A away, it adds up to 19, which still makes it to the quota. So that means A is not critical, and so I am not going to put a check mark next to the A. All right, in this combination, A is not critical. What about B? Same question, if I remove the B, do they still make it to 18? And the answer again is, uh, if I remove the B, they do still make it to 18, which means B also is not critical. And for the same reason, C also is not critical. So right here, nobody is critical in this row. That's, I'm just gonna not write anything there. Nobody is critical here. All right, in the first row. What about the second row? A and B adds up to 21. Is the A critical there? You think if I removed the A, do they still make it to 18? The answer is no, they don't still make it to 18. So the A is critical right here. So A is critical in that one. A and B add up to 21. You really need both of them. So B also is critical because if I took the B away, it would drop down to 11, which does not make it to the quarter. So A and B are both critical here and so on. This is how you've got to think it through every time. How about A and C add up to 20? Do you really need the A in there? I think you do really need the A in there because if you took the A away, it would be only nine, which is not enough. So the A is critical and also the C is critical here. C is worth nine. If I remove nine from there, it goes down to 11, which is not making it to 18. And then in B, C, the B and the C are both critical in that one too because the B is necessary and C also. All right, so what's my final answer? It's a fraction. Uh, a gets, B gets. Uh, the way you uh, count it up is how many check marks does A get is two out of a total of six because there are six total check marks there on the picture. So A is two out of six, B is two out of six, C is two out of six. One third each.
33% each if you prefer, although I, I will expect you to just leave it like this on your test without simplifying. So why would nobody be critical? I understand why A is critical. In the first row, nobody is critical. Even A, oh, you, you understand why A is not? No, I don't, I don't understand why B and C are. They are not. Because if I look here at B, all together it adds up to 30. If I take the B away, which is 10, it only adds up to 20. But 20 is still good enough to make it. And so B is also not critical. That's the Bonsop. I hope you remember how to do it. Anything else we should discuss publicly? Yeah? Can we do it in efficiency gap? Efficiency gap, sure. Um, let's try an efficiency gap example. Now, uh, I could ask you to look at a picture and find the efficiency gap, or I could just tell you some totals like we did on, on one of the homework problems. There was like a, I had you look up some real life numbers from an election. Um, I could just give you some, some numbers. How about, I'll give you some numbers here. Let's say that we have an election uh, between two parties. Let's say the D's and the R's. And let's say we have, um, how about four districts? One, two, three, four. And let's say the D's and the R's. Let's say in district one, the D's get 12 and the R's get 15. I'm just making these numbers up. In district two, let's say the D's get 10 and the R's get seven. In district three, the D's get uh, 20 and the R's get three. And in district four, the D's get 15 and the R's get 14. So I could give you an example like this. I tell you a bunch of numbers. This would be everything that I give you. And then I would say, from here, find the efficiency gap. All right. Or I could give you a picture like these. Um, the, the big Batman on the second page here is a picture divided into districts. Um, your first job in that kind of situation would be to just count up the dots and turn it into a table of numbers, all right? But that, that's always going to be easy to do. You just count the dots and write down how many are in each district, all right? Uh, anyway, let's continue from here. The efficiency gap. The next column that I put here is the total and then the threshold to win in each district, which will be slightly different if the totals are slightly different, and I believe they are in this case. So uh, 12 and 15 in the first district is 27. 10 and 7 is 17. 20 and 3 is 23, 15 and 14 is 29. So those are the total number of voters in each district. And now I need the threshold to win, which is always half of the total, and then you either round it up or add one. So in this case, the total is 27. Can anyone say what's the threshold there? 14. 14, yeah. This is the limit of which I, uh, I would expect you to do without a calculator. I, I would expect you to be able to do that. I hope you don't feel okay about half of 27 and you round it up. All right, what's the threshold in the next one? 17? Uh, half of that, I believe, is uh, eight and a half and you round it up to nine. 23, I think the threshold is 12. And 29, I think the threshold is 15. This is each time half and then rounding up or adding one, if it were, if you started with an even total. Okay, and now the important part is the wasted. D wasted, R wasted. I saw an interesting statistic uh, yesterday about the, the recent election that happened. You know, it didn't go so well for the Republicans. Although, something interesting is that the Republicans actually got more votes overall. If you look at the, the Congress uh, elections, more people voted for Republicans than for Democrats, but the Democrats ended up winning more um, House representative seats than the Republicans did. Um, how does that, how is that possible? It's because the Republicans were like winning even harder in places where they were already winning before. And so the extra votes that the Republicans got were mostly wasted whereas the Democrats actually won harder 
in races where it actually mattered and they were able to convert into some new Democrat representatives, which Republicans did less of. Anyway, it was about wasted votes. Uh, let's uh, decide here. The D's wasted. Remember the rule is every vote for the loser is wasted. So keep track of who's the winner each time. Every vote for the loser is wasted. So in the first line, um, the D's wasted 12 because they lost. And then the R's, how many is the uh, R wasted here? One. Yeah, I hope you remember. The wasted is, uh, for the winner, how many they got beyond the threshold. So in, uh, in the first row, it's one for the R's because the R's got 15, but they only needed 14. All right, the second line, the D's won with 10. That's one more than the threshold, so the D's wasted one. And then the R's uh, lost with seven, so the R's wasted seven. And in the third line, the D's won with 20, which is eight above the threshold. So the D wasted eight, the R wasted three. And then in the last line, the D's got 15, which equals the threshold exactly. That's zero wasted. And the R's got 14, which are all wasted. All right. Now to finish off, we just add these up. Add up the wasted. Uh, 12 and one and eight is 21. 1 and 7 and 3 and 14 is uh, 25, I believe. And so my final answer is, oh, I have to add the total of the totals also. This is 10, 17, 26 in this column. Using al Khwarizmi's method, I carry the 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 96. That's what they used to call it. I simply use al Khwarizmi's method. Nowadays, people just call it like, yeah, you just add them up. And they don't even think about whose method that is. I can't tell if that's an, is that an insult to al Khwarizmi, the man? Or is it a great honor for people to not even know who he is because we think that somehow that knowledge is like straight from God. It's not straight from God, it's from al Khwarizmi. 4 over 96 is the efficiency gap in favor of, what do you say, D's or R's? D's in this case, because the D's wasted fewer, the R's wasted more. So this is in favor of the D's. You don't have to simplify the fraction, although some people insist on simplifying the fraction. You can if you want to, I suppose. What else you want to discuss? <clears throat> yes? Um, for gerrymandering, if an outcome is impossible, is that just based off of the like that? Right. Yeah, you say, it's like, if the D's only have, you know, 12 squares, and you need five to win, then you could, then that means the D's, they could win two, but they can't win three because three would require 15, which is more than 12. That's the kind of thing you've got to say for deciding which ones are impossible. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, people have been asking me this a lot actually uh, about the homework. How do you know if a graph is connected or not? The answer is, is very easy if you know what to look for. So connected means that the graph is sort of all in one piece. So here is an example of a connected. How about this? That is connected. I can make a little doggy. This is connected, all right? Uh, because it's all like in one, uh, one piece. The technical definition is it is possible to get from any one of these vertices to any other along a path. Like this one can be joined to this one by a path inside the graph. So this one is connected. What does not connected look like? That's a graph in which there's like two separate pieces of it somehow, like this. That's not connected, just because it's in two separate chunks. 
if you want to be technical about it, how do I know this is not connected? It's because, for example, there's no way to get from this vertex here to this one here on a path. You can't get from here to there. So that's, that's, that means it's not connected. And so if you, if you can look at a picture of the graph, it's always going to be easy to tell if it's connected or not. Yeah? A what? Can you just say that one more time? An Euler, yes, she's talking about Euler circuits. The difference, uh, so an Euler circuit means it uses every edge without any repeats and it starts and finishes at the same point. Whereas an Euler path can start in one place and finish at a different place. Uh, and that's why the, the Euler path will always have two odds. One is the starting and one is the ending. Those are the special special points, whereas a circuit, they all look the same. I hope that answered the question. Yes. Yeah. Any others? Yes? Can you do a graph with Sure. Just sort of think, think about a graph. Imagine a graph. Um, how about, uh, here's one that was on the quiz for the other section. I think this is the other section. Let's um, imagine a graph oops, where um, each vertex is a person in this room, say. A person in this class. And two people are connected, two verts have an edge when, um, when their ages, let's talk about how old these people are, are within uh, two years, say, All right? And let's, let's say that I count, I count as a person in this class, right? I'm a person, um, and I'm in this class. So uh, each vertex is a person in this class, and two vertices have an edge connecting them when their ages are within two years of one another. Um, this was a part, two-parter on when I put this on the quiz for the other section. Um, anyone want to say, what do you think your degree is in this graph? Um, Think about, or just like, I don't know about you specifically, but just a typical degree in this graph. Um, let's say there's about, there are about 30 people in this class. Um, would you say, would you expect the degree of a typical person in the class to be like one or two, or like 100, or like 30? Any ideas? Yeah. Maybe a little bit under 30. Maybe a little under 30, yeah. Why do you say that? Because there could be some people who are more than two of us, or two years apart. Yeah. Because like most of you are actually within two years of each other, and so you'll all be connected to all of the other ones who are in that category. Um, not everybody, like I am more than two years older than the oldest one of you, I think. And so my degree, well, can anyone say what would my degree be in that case? If I really am older, more than two years older? Zero. Yeah, I would have degree zero. That means that I would have no edges for me to any of you, right? That's degree zero. Um, so I would say a uh, typical degree is about 30, I guess. I mean, I will say actually what he said was great. A bit less than 30. All right. My degree is zero because I'm more than two years older than any of you. Uh, I suppose if one of you was some kind of like... Um, child math prodigy, maybe one of you is like 12 years old, you would, you would also have degree zero because you're uh, younger than everybody else. Um, uh, I also asked a question, is this graph connected? What do you think? That means can you get from any person in here to uh, any other by following edges from one to another? No, why not? Yeah, right. My vertex, at least, is disconnected from everybody else's. Maybe somebody else, I don't know. So typical degree is a bit less than 30. 
and the graph is not connected. I would say because of the elderly professor. I'm more than two years older than the rest of you. Oh, yeah, that's right. The old guy, as she says, they're not my words. Yeah, he's, I think he's older than me, probably more than two years older than me. So, yeah, it's true. Yes? Uh, so my question, um, for number 11, would you just know that red has more words that rhyme? So you just understand that that's yeah. pretty straightforward. Right. You know, mm -hmm. Numerical. Right? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you will have to use sort of random common sense, although I, I, won't, I won't make obscure things that you're likely to not recognize. And it would be disconnected. Yes, that graph is definitely disconnected. Yeah. Thank you. Would the exam be this long? No, I would see he asked if, if the exam would be this long. I don't think so. 